Welcome to the Sunday Sermon on Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, and in just a few moments, our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, tells us about three enemies that want to destroy every child of God. His message, Don't Blame the Devil, is from 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. But first, as you grab your copy of God's Word and find your place, let's enjoy a few letters from our fellow Bible bus writers in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Here's the first letter. This program is changing my way of living. I am a saved Christian and need food for my faith. I follow you regularly, and I never miss a program. God's word fills me with heavenly joy. Before listening, I used to be in a bitter life. I lacked peace in my heart. I always was in trouble. The program really restored in me peace from God. Another listener from the Congo says, Since I started listening to you in my language of Lingala, it has helped strengthen my faith. I used to be a Muslim, and after listening to the program, I confessed, repented, and received the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus. My life has been transformed. We are no longer Muslims. We are Christian, children of God. My wife and I have created an intercession group. You help us read the Bible. Together we pray, fast, and listen to God's voice. This listener also in the Democratic Republic of the Congo listens not In the other language that we talked about before, Lingala, but this one in Swahili, she writes, I wanted to express my sincere appreciation for this program as it has sparked a deep interest within me. It has led me to believe in the divine creator of our Lord. Previously, I had doubts about embracing this belief for the purpose of salvation. However, after attentively listening to your words, I acknowledge my ignorance and wholeheartedly repented for my lack of faith. This profound experience has brought about a remarkable transformation in my life. Aren't those great letters from the Congo? And you know, God's promise in Isaiah 55, 11 is still true today. His word does not return void. So thank you for praying. Thank you for partnering with us. Well, if you haven't yet joined our world prayer team, then this week we're traveling through the continent of Africa where God is using through the Bible in significant ways. You can pray for listeners like the ones we heard today and millions of others as well. If you want to find out more and sign up for that team, just visit ttb.org forward slash pray. Do it today. And if our time in God's Word is changing your heart and your life, you know we'd love to hear your story and maybe even share it here with others. You can email that story to BibleBus at ttb.org. You can always write to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. And you can also call and leave a message at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Now let's pray as we begin our study. Heavenly Father, it's with joy that we study your word together and a privilege to hear stories of how you work in our lives. As we study, we ask that you draw us near to you and speak to the areas of our lives where you specifically want to work and help us cooperate. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Here's the Sunday Sermon on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Don't blame the devil. And we have a text for you tonight. It's taken from 2 Timothy, the second chapter, the 22nd verse. Flee also youthful lust, but follow after righteousness, love, faith, peace. This evening, we are going to bring a message that I believe is as different as any that I've ever preached. And I do ask for your prayers. It was Victor Hugo who put forth the thesis years ago that the individual has three enemies in this life. First of all, there is society. And in order to sustain that thesis, he wrote his novel, Les Miserables. He said that the church was the enemy of the individual and it was a decadent church in his day, and he wrote his novel, Notre Dame. He said also that nature was the enemy of the individual, and he wrote his novel, Toilers of the Sea, to sustain that thesis. May I say to you that he was almost scriptural. For the Christian has three enemies which will constantly oppose him, seek to destroy him, and these three enemies are called in the word of God, world 
the flesh, and the devil. It's this unholy trinity that's lined up against the child of God. But these three are different. They are all allied, of course, against the Christian, and they have one object in mind, and that's to destroy him. They team up against the child of God, but they are different, and we need to identify and make a distinction among them. Any one of the three will rob the Christian of his peace and of his joy and of his service and of his reward and will keep the unsaved person from coming to a saving knowledge of Christ. Any one of these three. Now, in the book of Joshua in the Old Testament, we have these three illustrated for us, which is always helpful to understand them. We have these three enemies there presented as the three enemies that stood in the way of the children of Israel in entering the promised land. These three enemies prevented the children of Israel from possessing the promised land and enjoying all of its benefits. That was, first of all, Jericho. Jericho represents the world. And then to the north there was the little town of Ai, and Ai represents the flesh. And then around Jerusalem there was an unholy alliance of the Gibeonites, and they made an alliance with Israel, which, of course, Joshua and the Israelites should not have made, and they represent the devil. Now, my beloved, the strategy of battle was different against each one of these enemies. The method of attaining a victory was different in each individual case. For instance, I can't find where the children of Israel were ever asked to march around the little town of Ai and that the walls would fall down. I can't find anywhere where the children of Israel were told to make a league or to beware of a league with the people of Jericho. The people of Jericho shut up the city and had nothing in the world to do with them. May I say to you, my beloved, these three enemies of the Christian are different enemies. The strategy of them is different, and our method of overcoming them is altogether different. And our failure to distinguish among them is one of the things that's causing defeat tonight in the life and heart of many Christians, and I think that it's having an effect on causing many unsaved people not to come to a saving knowledge of Christ. Now, will you notice briefly as we mention these three enemies? The first one is the world, and we have some very definite language given to us concerning the world over in First John, the second chapter, the 15th verse, and will you listen to this language? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, the world is represented there as society today. The ambitions and desires that you find out in the world today, and as we move back yonder for our illustration, Yonder in the city of Jericho, the children of Israel were told that they were to make no alliance, they were to have nothing in the world to do with the city, that they were to march around it, and they were also told they were not to fight against Jericho. Have you ever noticed that? And a great many Christians today to think that we are to fight against the world. May I say to you tonight that you and I will never get a victory over the world by fighting it. So many Christians today, they go out like a Don Quixote against liquor, against social ills, and against many of these things, yet, and in spite of all that the church has said and done, what little effect 
it's having, for instance, upon alcohol and the consumption of it today. So that we need to consider our strategy, my beloved. We are never told to fight the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And my beloved, just as this man Joshua was told to march around the city of Jericho, may I say that we read, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down. They did an act of faith, and it's only as you and I face the world by faith, not by fighting it, but by laying hold of God through faith can we have a victory over the world, my beloved. Then the devil is an enemy of the child of God, represented back in the book of Joshua by the Gibeonites, and it was said of them that they worked wilily. That's a picture, may I say, of the business the devil's in today. I personally do not think the devil's on Skid Row tonight. I think he's in the business of religion in Southern California, as he is everywhere. He's always been in that business. He's a spiritual enemy. We're told to put on the whole armor that we might be able to overcome the wiles of the devil. And we are told to resist the devil, and he'll flee from you, and greater is he that's in you than the one that's in the world. So that the child of God today is encouraged to stand against the devil, my beloved, and against all the falsehood that's round about us today, for that's the thing the devil is engaged in today. Now there's the third enemy, and it's this enemy that we're going to talk about tonight, the flesh, the old nature. We are told in our text tonight, flee youthful lust. May I say to you that's a different strategy, is it not, to say resist the devil. We are told to stand against the devil, but we are told to turn and run when it comes to the things of the flesh. And I want to tell you, my friend, that just happens to be different strategy. A buck private in the rear rank knows the difference between forward march and to the rear march. Any buck private knows that, but apparently a great many Christians don't know that today. And when God says to us when we are fighting the flesh, he says, retreat. He says, go in reverse. Go in the opposite direction. We say, not on your life. We're going to stand to it. And we're going to fight. And most of the times we come off loser. All the time we come off loser today. We are told, my beloved, flee youthful lust. We are told today that we are to retreat and get away from this thing. I remember hearing this whimsical story. It's been many years ago now about a student at the Moody Bible Institute. He was being quizzed by someone. And he was asked the question, if you were in a hotel room and a call girl entered the room, what would you do? He said, I tell you what I'd do. I'd get up and turn in a fire alarm and then jump out the window. Well, my beloved, that may sound rather silly to you, but may I say that he's lots more scriptural than a great many Christians are today in their conduct relative to the things of the flesh, my beloved. Now, tonight, can we identify and classify and label what the Scripture means by the flesh? I think we can. And I want to spend a few moments with that. I don't want to be tedious, but I do want to be helpful tonight to a great many folks because I know not only those here but multitudes listening in tonight, this is the place of defeat tonight for multitudes of Christians. Now, the Scripture uses the word flesh when it speaks of just humanity with no reference at all to anything evil. The physical part of man, the meat and the bones and the blood. For instance, it says in John 1, 14, the Word was made flesh. That means he took upon himself our humanity. He had a, a body like we have. And that's what it means there by flesh. You will find over in the Gospel of Luke, for instance, and Luke was a doctor, you know, and he was very interested in, I think, recording this 
The Lord Jesus says in the very last of the gospel, the 24th chapter, the 39th verse, Behold my hands and my feet, that it's I myself, handle me and see for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Now, in the scripture, the word flesh is used many times like that. But in most cases, and you always determine it by the context, it's used to speak of the old, Adamic, fallen human nature that all of us have. That unregenerated, unrefined, untrained, uncontrolled nature that every person that's a son of Adam has when he comes into this world. The natural man, the total personality, what today is termed the psychological man, with all of his propensities, all of his drives, all of his desires, all of his frustrations, it's the total man. And that's the way the Scripture generally uses the term. Now you will find it used like that. Let me give some references, and you'll see the utter contempt that God has for the flesh. He has no confidence in the flesh whatsoever, my beloved, that nature that you and I are born into this world with. Listen to this. In John 3, 6, the Lord Jesus said, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. It's always flesh. You can do a great deal with it, improve it, reform it. Many things can be done with it. But, my beloved, after you have treated it in every way that's possible, It'll always be flesh. And the Lord Jesus said again in John 6, 63, The flesh profiteth nothing. He had no confidence in the flesh whatsoever. That the flesh was no value to God at all, and God could not use it at all. When you come to the epistle to the Romans, you find Paul making even a stronger statement than that. In Romans 3.20 he says, Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be saved. God puts down categorically the statement that the flesh, this old Adamic nature that you and I have, can have no part in our salvation. It makes no contribution. It has no value. God can't use it. God has condemned it. It actually becomes the enemy of the child of God. And the minute you become God's child, as we're going to see in a moment, the flesh becomes your enemy, my beloved. Now, will you notice something else? That doesn't conclude all that he has to say concerning the flesh by any means. He says that the flesh is utterly corrupt. Over in Romans, the seventh chapter, Paul says, I know that in me, that is, my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Now, my beloved, I'm not sure tonight that, well, I'm not sure that every Christian tonight is willing to say that, that there's no good in me whatsoever. I find us always hedging like this. Well, now, that's true to a certain extent, but I remember back yonder, I did a very fine thing when I was a boy. And you can't imagine how generous I was on one occasion. And you can't imagine how fine I acted one time. We are inclined to think that it's all right for Paul to say it in an academic sort of way. I know that in me, that is, within my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. But after all, we're a little different, and there may be one or two good things in us. Are you willing to believe the Bible tonight when it says that there's no good thing dwelling within your flesh? My friend, until you're willing to take that position, you're already defeated. The very minute that you believe that somehow or another that you can lean on this weak reed today that's known as the flesh, and somehow or another 
You can pamper it and excuse it and somehow or another bring it through, maybe even put it in a frozen food locker and preserve it just a little, that somehow or another it's not as bad as the Scripture says it is. May I say that you're doomed to awful defeat, not until you and I come to the position and stand at the cross of Christ and see him and die there and say he's dying because I'm a vile, rotten sinner. My friend, until we've done that, we have never, never even gotten in the battle that leads to victory over the flesh. Now Paul says something else about the flesh. Will you listen to him in Romans 8, 3? For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Paul makes it clear there was nothing wrong with the law, but there was something radically wrong with the flesh. God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemns sin in the flesh. He's not through. He's going to say something now that's without doubt the most sweeping statement that you can find anywhere. It's in the eighth verse of the eighth chapter of the epistle to the Romans. Will you listen to this? So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Tonight, my friend, and I want to say just this word tonight to any that are not Christian, you tonight cannot do anything that will please God. No good works. Those that are in the flesh cannot please God. The child of God tonight that is producing the works of the flesh, I don't care how good they might be and how well he might be applauded down here, they smell to high heaven, and God would not let them get into his presence at all. God has no use for it. God says that the works of the flesh that they are no good in his sight whatsoever, and that those that are in the flesh, they cannot please God at all. Now, that's an awful thing to say about us, isn't it? I don't. I wouldn't let anyone say that about you except God, friends. But he says it about you, and he's gone now even a little farther than that. God has so arranged the future that in heaven there will be no flesh to glory. Have you ever noticed that he says that no flesh should glory in his presence? There will never be a human being that will ever stand in God's presence and pat himself on the back in heaven and say, Well, you know, I was a smart boy. Do you know I did some very nice things? My friend, may I say to you tonight, when you and I get to heaven, there will be no flesh to glory there. It will all be to glorify the Lamb upon the throne, and nothing will accrue to the individual. Now, somebody says, say, that's rough, isn't it? Yes, that's rough, my friend, but let's get in a position to get a victory, because many of us need a victory over the flesh and now, again, let's hear Paul at the end of 1 Corinthians, because he may have changed his mind before he reached the end of the epistle. Let's see if he did. In 1550, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. God has no arrangement whatsoever to take any man in his natural condition into his presence. That's the reason that God says, that the Lord Jesus said to Nicodemus, a religious man, a good man, as far as the standards of this world are concerned, a moral man. He said to him, ye must be born again. You must receive a nature from God. You must have the operation of God upon your heart and upon your life, for as you are, you're not fit for heaven. Now, my beloved Therefore, God says that he's not going to redeem flesh at all. Makes it very clear that he's never going to redeem flesh. Will you listen to Paul as he wrote to the Galatians in the second chapter, the 16th verse, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ? 
even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. God has no place in his plan of salvation for the flesh. Paul says that we haven't anything to boast of in the flesh at all. Now, somebody says to me tonight, Preacher, can you be just a little bit more specific about the flesh? Just what do you mean now about that nature? Can you label it? Can you identify it now clearly for us? Friends, I believe that we can. And you can always label any kind of a tree by the kind of fruit it bears. And you can tell what kind of machine a machine is if you can see what it's doing, what it's turning out, the kind of works it performs. My wife asked me, we were going through the country, she said, what kind of machine is that over in the field? Well, the thing was baling hay, and I told her I thought it was a hay baler because it was baling hay. And you know, that's what it was. You can always identify a thing by the works that it turns out. Now you can identify the flesh by the works that it performs. Now, do you want to know tonight what the flesh does, what that old nature does that you and I have? Will you listen tonight? Paul says that the flesh warreth against the spirit that's in a Christian. That old nature is against the Christian, my beloved. That old nature will seek to destroy us. And Paul says the flesh warreth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Now listen to him. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. That is, the works of the flesh are obvious. It's easy to tell the works of the flesh, and they come under three categories here. Will you listen to them? It's an ugly-looking brood, but will you listen to them? They are, first of all, the physical side of the flesh, then the mental side, and then the emotional side. And may I say that that's a good psychological division that Paul makes here of the flesh. Will you listen to it? Here is the physical side, what we call immorality today, and here is where we limit the flesh. We think this is all the flesh means. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Now, this is what the flesh does. This is the physical side. This is immorality. This is the dirty side. Then there is the mental side. And will you notice that? It's given here as idolatry and witchcraft. Actually, the word idolatry, I think, means today covetousness. And that is a sin of the flesh. Anything tonight, my friend, that you covet, don't ever blame that on the devil. Blame that on yourself. Anything that you covet is because of the flesh that's within you. Idolatry, and then the word witchcraft. Well, I have another translation that says sorcery. That's not quite good enough. May I say that the word in the Greek is pharmacia. We get our word pharmacy from it. It means to be drugged, my friend, not only physically, but to be drugged mentally. And how many today are being drugged mentally? Here we have presented to us the mental side, the enmity that Paul speaks of, of the fleshly mind, my beloved, which is enmity, he says, against God. Then there is this emotional side. And will you notice? these things that are given here, hatred, variance, emulations, that means jealousy, wrath, that means a bad temper, strife, seditions, seditions mean divisions. When you cause divisions, that's the manifestation of the flesh. And may I say to you tonight, you hear people say today, the devil got into our church and is causing divisions. My friend, the devil is not responsible for it. The flesh did that. The flesh did that, not the devil. We're blaming the devil for things he's not guilty of at all. And then we're told 
envyings, murders, drunkenness. And I want you to notice something here that's amazing. They've been trying to say in recent years that alcoholism is a disease and that it is an emotional sort of thing. May I say, Paul will go along with you, friend, but Paul says it comes under the sin of the flesh. It is a sin, whether you call it a disease or not. And Paul correctly labels it over on the emotional side. He puts drunkenness here, revelings, and then such like. There are many other things that he does not mention here at all. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ confirmed this list that Paul gives us, my beloved. And he says that these things that the flesh produce are things that come out of the flesh and don't come any other place. Will you listen to the Lord Jesus speak now over in Matthew 15, 18? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. Now here is come what comes out of the heart. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. Now, my friend, these are things that can be labeled sins of the flesh, and don't blame the devil for them. It's like Adam in the Garden of Eden, the woman thou gavest me. And it's the tendency of Christians today to have a weakness of the flesh, and when they do, they say, well, you know, the devil is responsible for this. My friend, tonight the devil is not responsible for the weakness of the flesh. And tonight, since the flesh is your enemy, we need to recognize him and we need to use the strategy that we are told to use here. And we need to diagnose our own particular case. We hear today people make a statement like this. Well, you know, the devil tempted me to lie. My friend, the devil didn't tempt you to lie. You lied because you've got a nature that's like that. Somebody says, I was tempted to steal. You know, I was tempted by the devil to steal. No, you wasn't tempted to the devil to steal. You were tempted because of the flesh, my beloved. You have that tendency in the flesh. And until you and I recognize that and deal with it like that and put the blame where it belongs, we'll never be able to get a victory over the flesh. Now let's see if we can diagnose our disease and prescribe a remedy. I come back to our text now. Flee youthful lust. And you remember that Peter says in his epistle, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as pilgrims, and strangers, that you abstain from fleshly lust, that you get away from these things, that you retreat from them. Oh, you hear people say today, I'm no coward. I've never talked to a drunkard yet that didn't say, well, when I get ready, I can give this up. Never has a man yet had a sin of the flesh that he didn't say, well, when the time comes, I'm man enough to give the thing up, but my friend, they don't realize the thing has got him, and it's the sin of the flesh, and we are told to flee from it, get as far from it as possible. I think of the fellow that went to the funeral, and at this funeral, there was a ventriloquist, and he thought he wanted to have some fun, and when the pallbearers were letting the casket down into the grave, why, this ventriloquist threw his voice into the casket and said, Boys, let me down easy. And this fellow that was there at the funeral was telling a friend about it. And he said, Do you know that when they were letting that casket down, that that corpse spoke right out of that casket and said, Boys, let me down easy. His friend says, Well, did they let him down easy, or did they drop him? And this fellow says, Well, how's I to know? My friend, he didn't stay to see he got away. He didn't know. He didn't know whether they dropped him or not, because he left before that happened. And I want to say that that's the better part of valor today for a child of God in sins of the flesh. Flee youthful lust. And there's a note of urgency in that word. Don't 
state analyze the situation. Don't rationalize the case. A man said to me that it dropped into an awful sin. He says, well, all human beings do this, and I'm a human being. I said, brother, you are whipped. The very minute that you stay next to that thing and try to reason about the thing, you're lost in sins of the flesh. We are told to flee from those things, and we're to deal with the flesh. You remember the children of Israel were victorious at Jericho. They overcame the world and blew the trumpets and marched around victorious, and the walls fell down. And then they went up to the little town of Ai, and they were so self-confident. They said, little Ai, oh, Joshua said, we only sent a couple thousand men up there. We can overcome it. And then we read that the children of Israel fled before Ai. What had happened? You remember that Joshua went in before the Lord, and he said, oh, Lord, your people are fleeing before the enemy. And what a terrible word that is to get around over the countryside that your people are defeated. And God said to him, but Joshua, you've got to deal with the sin that's in the camp. You've got to deal with the flesh. And they went through that camp, and finally they ferreted out that man, Achan. He wouldn't come out in the open. The flesh never will come out in the open. The flesh never will admit that it's to blame. And finally old Achan was ferreted out, and when they called him out, he said, yes. He said, I saw a goodly Babylonian garment, and I looked upon it, and I lusted after it, and then I took it. That's the way the flesh goes, my beloved. Oh, if that man Achan, when he went yonder into the city of Jericho, if the minute that he saw that thing that had so entranced his eye, if he had turned and fled, there would have been a victory for him, and there would have been a victory for the children of Israel. Flee, youthful lust. I beseech you, therefore, as pilgrims and strangers, that ye abstain from fleshly lust. My beloved, many a Christian is going out today like a Don Quixote attacking the windmills of this world and saying, I don't do this, I don't do the other thing, I don't do something else. But I want to tell you, he's being defeated within. He's put on the whole armor of God, and he says, I'm overcoming the devil, but I'm defeated within. Brother, he's got ants in his armor. On the inside, the flesh is overcoming. On the inside, the flesh has defeated him, and defeated him because he thought since it was so small that he could overcome. May I say to you tonight, my friend, that the biggest enemy that you have is not somebody outside of you, but the biggest enemy that you have tonight is this old nature that is within you. That old nature, my friend, if you're unsaved, will take you to hell. That old nature will drag you down, and Christian friend, that old nature tonight will rob you of your peace and rob you of your joy and rob you tonight of your reward and rob you of your service and tonight will do more against you than anything else. And tonight we make excuses. We play about this thing and we won't deal with it. And John says, if we will confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If tonight a Christian will deal with that thing in his life, God will give him a victory. I tell you, friends, we have to deal with the flesh, and to confess means to agree with God about it. You have to agree with God that you've got that kind of a nature, and it's as bad as he says that it is. My friend, Christ died to deliver us from the world, the flesh, and the devil. And he wants us to have a victory over the flesh. And as the poet said years ago, Oh, for a man to rise in me that the man I am might cease to be. And it was in Shakespeare's play, uh, Julius Caesar, where Brutus says to Cassius, It's not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. And tonight, my beloved, the difficulty with many of us 
We pointed the finger outside and says, that's to blame. He's to blame. The devil's to blame. Don't blame the devil. Blame yourself. Blame the flesh. And take it before God and judge it. I wouldn't be faithful tonight as the minister if I didn't bring a message like this. Even to doctors today are changing their attitude toward their patients. Have you noticed it? They have a new bedside manner. A few years ago, they wouldn't tell a patient if he had a disease that was fatal. They would withhold that information. They're changing today. And then didn't you rejoice to hear the president of the American Medical Association say the other day, and it was in all the papers, he said, no man has a right to practice medicine that doesn't believe in a supreme being. May I say that that's a marvelous step in the right direction. And may I say to you tonight, as a spiritual doctor, and one that ought to be faithful to his patients, May I say to you tonight, my beloved, if you had cancer and I was a medical doctor and you came to me, I'll say this to you, I'd tell you what you had. And tonight, the great physician says to you and me, we've got something worse than cancer. We have the flesh and it'll destroy us. It's our enemy. And he says to flee. Flee from these days and follow after righteousness, peace, faith, love. All of these speak of Christ. If we confess our sins, take them to him. Take them to him, the great physician. I tell you, friends, he'll deal with the thing that's defeating many of us tonight as Christians and keeping some from coming to Christ. Christ is the great physician can give you the victory. It's true. In Jesus, we find the victory, the power to overcome the things that destroy us, and the help that we need to follow after the things that really matter. If you want to download a few free resources that'll explain more, just visit ttb.org and search for How to Know God, or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE, and we'll put a few in the mail. Again, that's 1-800-65-BIBLE or ttb.org. And for more great teaching by Dr. McGee, why don't you hop aboard the Bible bus every day this week as we continue our journey through 2 Timothy chapter by chapter. You can listen through our app, that's the way I do it, or you can visit ttb.org to join us online or see if your local radio station carries through the Bible. Another great way to join us is by downloading our Bible companion for 2 Timothy. You'll find it for free at ttb.org. And once you do, everything you need to study will be right at your fingertips, including prompts to listen to Dr. McGee's teaching and then a link to the text that we're studying so you can read it yourself. And then each study's got several reflection questions to answer on your own or as a group if you're studying with friends. It's really a great resource. I use it myself with my own small group. So download your copy today at ttb.org or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE if we can help you find it. I'm Steve Schwetz, thanking God for his word and your company with us on the Bible bus. Now, as we go, I pray God's spirit guides us in applying what we learned in 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. With his help, may we run from childish indulgences of the flesh and seek his righteousness every day. Jesus Join us each weekday for our five-year daily study through the whole Word of God. Check for times on this station or look for Through the Bible in your favorite podcast store and always at ttb.org.